Dr. Solis. Um, first of all, what's, uh, what's your role here at the university? I'm a professor of uh, pathology and former chair of uh, pathology in the Department of Lab Medicine uh, Pathology. I run an entity called National Kidney Foundation Cyber Nephrology uh, and a bunch of other things like that, that that sort of combine you know, the informatics, communication, high tech side of things with uh, medicine generally. So cyber medicine, cyber nephrology, those are some so, of So technology is a big component to what you're doing nowadays. Yeah, and, and, and partly because um, consensus generation has for 21, 22 years been a big thing that I'm doing. And you can only do that if you have modern uh, technology sort of at the cutting edge. So the BAMF classification, which is the worldwide standard by which solid organ uh, transplant biopsies are read, when I began that in 91, of course, the internet didn't exist yet. So I was spending like $20,000, $30,000 on fax. <laughs> it wasn't working very well, you know? And then the internet came, and so I, I was the first to use the internet in, in a lot of ways in, in at least my part of uh, medicine. And um, I've continued to have this strong interest in where technology is going because y you need to standardize things in an intellectually enlightened way. You know, Stalin and Mussolini also standardized things, made the trains run on time, but are not regarded favorably in the light of history. I don't want to be like that. So I'm standardizing things in medicine, but I want to maintain uh, intellectual freedom amongst the people who are part of these uh, Enterprises, so so it's really interesting figuring out how to use technology to do that. It's not just face-to-face -face meetings; it's also incorporating people who can't be at the meeting. It's keeping the consensus generation going between the meetings. So that's the kind of thing that led to this strong interest in uh, technology and you know communications in. General, so that, that that's that's why I have those so those interests. So, from the technology standpoint, then, how do you see this? Because um, I guess everything you do with pathology is, you know, ultimately to better the patient, right? Yes. So, how do you see, you know, using advent technology and everything? How do you see that, you know, improving the patient standards in the future? Well, right now, uh, every pathology slide. It's a bit sad to think about, but at the moment that you stain it that stain starts fading. And the vulnerability of the slide is, is very great. You, you can think this crucial diagnostic material representing a piece of the patient, you know, that, that's either been biopsied or, or a larger piece of the patient removed. And this slide defines what's going on in that part of the patient and may be very, very important to, to the future life of the patient. Well, that individual slide, you can lose it, you can drop it, you, you, there are all sorts of bad things that can happen to it, and it starts fading right away, so the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, it's just a shadow of its former self, you know, it's not, this brightly colored doesn't have all of the content that it had when it was first stained. So with uh, digital whole slide imaging, you can capture that forever. You can make as many copies. You can have a million copies of a slide if, if you want. There's really no limit. And then when you start thinking about that, you know, you say, well, okay, isn't this kind of like mind uploading? And uh, I mean, so how is that gonna work? And yeah, so, so it has some broader, you know, analogies in the world at large. And people who could care less about microscope uh, pathology slides could still find a lot of the things that we think about to be quite interesting. You know, how adequate is, uh, you know, digital copy? Is it better than the real 
Is it not as good? In kidney pathology, it's actually better than the real slide. It doesn't fade, you don't lose it, all, all that sort of thing. In cytology, looking at cells, whole cells, right at the moment it isn't quite as good because you can't easily focus up and down and, and get the top, the middle, and the bottom of the cell. Uh, we're, we're beginning to reach a point where you can do that, but it's just not perfected. It's not ideal yet. So it depends upon what, what part of medicine, what, what, what part of uh, pathology you talk about, whether the digital or the virtual image, the virtual slide is actually superior to the real one or not quite, but it's, it's getting very close. So from the patient's point of view, it makes for more reliable diagnoses, better medical records, you know, all, all sorts of things that, that improve uh, uh, the health of the patient, the speed with which you can uh, access the data, all, all those things are, are enhanced. Great. So this. in terms of just kind of general pathology, then, like how accurate would this statement be? that pathology has mainly been focused on the healing and the preventative measures of current ailments of the patients. Yeah, so I, I think you can look at pathology as a subset of medicine in general. And right now, medicine is quite disease-oriented still, with the idea of in intervening once the patient has uh, you know, overt disease. But um, over time, we'll get rid of most of the uh, diseases that we know of now. They'll either be treatable or completely preventable. They will not occur or they can be immediately reversed. That doesn't mean physicians won't have anything to do because there are two other sides. What about man-made diseases? What about uh, diseases as bioterrorism. There's, there's that aspect. And then what about medical enhancement of human capability? You want to be able to run faster, see farther, you know, all, all those sorts of things. All that would be feasible and probably eventually medicine will be mostly about enhancing human functions and, and enhancing human capabilities and much less about uh, disease. You know, a disease will be a rarity. And so, you know, pathology will reflect that. Um, when you enhance somebody, there needs to be quality control over how that's happening. Like right now, when you make a um, urinary bladder using 3D printing and you know cells and 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 you make uh, three a, a bladder from stem cells it's a bit lumpy i mean it, it works as a bladder it just doesn't quite look like a bladder it's not uh, symmetrical you know well what's the cause of the l lumpiness you know so 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 there are these questions it's not like we're going to go at a certain moment from the world as it is now to the world where just we're creating all organs from stem cells and everything is going to be fine. I, I think there, there'll be intermediate stages there where saying, well, is this organ we created from this stem cell normal? You know, are all its components hook, hooked together in a normal way? Does it have everything it's supposed to have? And uh, so, uh, pathologists, laboratory physicians will still have an important role figuring those things out. So, and, and I think we, we need to keep up. Uh, physicians and laboratory physicians need to be aware of where the future is going and, uh, and they're, they're always going to be important uh, physician roles and it may require learning new things, but obviously they're, they're often exciting new things, just like many of the subjects in this course. So one thing you find in the course, you never see anybody sleeping, right? So, so I mean, a lot of courses, there are really only three choices, you know. The, the, the student can stay awake, they can sleep, or they can leave the room. Now, 
it, people bringing their own you know computing devices the fourth thing is they can be watching something else right but um, yeah so the option of sleeping doesn't occur very often in this course because people are sort of you know amazed at the, at the, at the things that we're talking about and they want to be a part of it mm -hmm. and and so yeah so actually before we get to the course I understand you did go to the Singularity University Yes. And it was after the Singular University that you really impacted the way you did this course. Right. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your experience there? Yeah, it, it's an awesome experience, uh, both with the colloquial and the actual technical use of the word awesome. I mean, it inspires awe. It, um, it also is an experience that grows. You know, I was there for nine days. And uh, most experiences like that, as soon as it's over, the amount that you learn gradually degrades. Probably every night as you dream, you forget some of it because it's just not that, that interesting. And, you know, eventually, a few months later, you know relatively little of, of what you learned. And this is entirely the opposite because you sort of learn in those nine days a, a formula or or, or, or way of, of building and you keep on building because you you, you, you get so incentivized you, you get so motivated to keep on keeping on you know to keep trying to make the experience of this uh, wonderful course just go on for the rest of your life and keep the uh, connections the personal friendships that you made with the other students and with the faculty to keep that going too. We just had a student, one of the uh, PhD uh, students in the course asked me today if he thought I, I he should go to that. <laughs> so I said yes, you know. I, I think there, there are many different ways to do it. You can take the you know, executive course, which is short. You, you can take an entire summer as a graduate student there. I, I, I think there, there, you can go to Future Med, which is just focused specifically on the future of medicine. So there are many different ways to experience uh, Singularity University, but it, it, it is a, a unique and wonderful experience. And so, oh, sorry, uh, which program did you take? I, I took the nine-day executive program. It was at the end of February and early March in 2010. It happened to be a remarkably successful program uh, in that a lot of the people who were there, well, for instance, the current CEO was one of the fellow students then. So Rob, Rob Nail was a student uh, along with me during that. And he, it's it's a long story. It's an, an exciting story how he ended up to be the current uh, C, CEO. But that just shows you that I mean it certainly grew for him. <laughs> the uh, the current CEO of what um, Singular University? Yes, oh, yes, oh, okay. yes. Wow, yeah. that's pretty interesting. Yeah, so they're the big boss. Of the whole thing. Yeah, I, I guess you, you can look at the founders, they have their own role. Uh, so um, Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil are, are the founders of uh, the university. But there has to be a leader who sort of keeps it going day to day and who hires and fires people and all that sort of thing. So that's what uh, Rob Nail does, and 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 yeah, he he was a fellow student along with with me. He has more of an entrepreneurial background than I than I do, and, and but so he was highly suited to take on this role. But yeah, so um, he he gave sort of a, um, a wrap up or commentary of what that nine days had been like that was a particularly effective uh, interview or you know written statement uh, and I, I suppose just grew from from that there there have been various twists and turns in terms of the leadership of uh, Singularity University but he ended up being the best person to run it and so that that's what happened yeah so 
Uh, was it like your experience at Singular University that prompted you to start this course? It's a combination of things, I guess. Um, there, there was an existing course in lab medicine that I thought I men, might end up taking over and uh, it was kind of a traditional course so I had these ideas of ways to make it more modern and so on. So then somebody en else ended up taking over that course so I thought well I might as well go for it you know. I, had this idea, I, I've been arguing for for years that education needs to reinvent itself. We need different structures. We need a cross-disciplinary approach beyond what everybody has been thinking about. They're thinking, well, you know, maybe we can take a bit of art and science, but okay, but what about law? What about all these other, you know, uh, components? Um, that uh, they they hadn't been thinking of. They had been thinking of interdisciplinary with maybe two disciplines or three. You know, I can get up to six or seven and I'm still not done. I can think of a reason that, you know, practically every human endeavor is basically impacted by these changes that were talking about in the future and and all these people need to talk to each other um, so, yeah so um, as far as the class goes um, how is it structured then like, you, you say it's different from the general mold of the university yeah so how is it structured so it's like well uh, for one thing the faculty members are not competing with each other at all you might wonder well how are we able to assign the students to critique a previous lecture in the course. And why don't other cor courses do that? Well, most courses, everybody teaching in it, are, they're from the same discipline, or let's say the same department. So they're subtly competing with each other. If you ask the students to criticize previous lectures, this would never work because like the, this changes the hierarchy of the faculty in that particular department. If the students criticize one particular person's lecture more than somebody else's, this uh, you, you know lessens their subtle ranking within the you know department. We don't have anything like that. We have such a diverse faculty from all different uh, um, faculties from from all different uh, roles. Deans. Yeah, yeah. So we have the Dean of Science, the Dean of Arts. We have Earl Waugh, who had many chair roles in arts. He, he was in uh, religious studies and so on. Many interesting uh, leadership roles within the university outside of medicine. And then he turned 65 and he reinvented himself as a faculty member within medicine where he's been teaching for the past uh, 10 years. So um, we, we, we have a fascinating uh, heterogeneity amongst the faculty and the faculty are also the, the students in the course. Some of the most interesting sessions, we have a large number of faculty members sitting there in the seats, sitting in rapt awe, listening to the lecture and then asking questions afterwards. And of course, we began that way. You see, in order to teach a regular course in the university, it takes 14 months from the time that you propose the course to the time it's actually in the paper catalog and, and everything's going. Well, wow. that was way too slow for me. So in the first semester that we taught the course, I was thinking, well, how are we gonna do this? Well, turns out that for a hospital rounds that people get um, continuing professional learning credit for from the Royal College, you can get that approval almost instantly. You just send them the you know description of what you want to teach and how often it meets and all that sort of thing. The next day they send back a fax and you're in.